Hi, I'm Adam Summer. You're listening to the Yershami Talk podcast with the support of the Yeshivat Debar Yushalayim in Harnof, Jerusalem. This is Shvius, Chapter 6, Halacha 1. This is Part 4 of the Shir. Yesterday, we were covering something really interesting. We were covering the status of land that's Ole Mitzrayim, but was not conquered by the Ole Babel. And we were trying to understand what's going on with it re- with regards to Tuma. Is that going to have foreign land Tuma? Now, there was an area and the the uh, the Sanhedrin of Rebbe in yesterday's Shir went ahead and uh, declared that everything that's right on the border of uh, Eretz Yisrael, that's the Ole Babel territory, even if it's where just beyond it is Ole Mizraim territory, it's going to count as Tahor. That's going to be a Darabanan thing since it was Darabanan anyway. The foreign land Tuma thing was a Darabanan enactment that came about 80 years before the Second Temple was destroyed. Uh, to keep the Jews in Eretz Yisrael, to keep Kohanim from leaving Eretz Yisrael, and to make sure that uh, the people would stay here. So what they were doing was they they basically were being lenient on something for uh, for this because you know it's a big question as to whether the land that's going to be Ole Mitzrayim land is going to have kedusha or not with regards to. Uh, Maestros, Truma, the laws of the land like Shvius. And so yesterday we were trying to figure out what's going to be with regards to Tuma over there just beyond that border where uh, Rebbe and his Sanhedrin declared it as Tahor. So we had the case yesterday of Ashkelon, which Ashkelon was uh, conquered by the armies of Joshua. But it was not taken back by uh, the Ole Bavel. And they ruled that all the parts that were on the border, they would be Tahor, and then the areas beyond it would be Teme. I'm sorry. They, they also ruled that it was um, Tahor. They also ruled that it was uh, Tahor. But uh, again, that's a leniency. That's a leniency because that's not a. Uh, a Doraita enactment, uh, and so um, that's what's going on. Now, today we're going to get into something a little bit dif- different. We're going to be getting into Kohanim that are going outside of the land, and we're going to cover today an interesting area. We're going to cover this area that was in the tribe of Ruven, and it was not it was not conquered by the Ole... Mitzrayim per se, it was actually taken by Moshe Rabbeinu. And so it wasn't taken by Joshua and the conquering army. It was when Moshe Rabbeinu was there. And then there's going to be a question there. Is that going to have the status for Shvius today and Trumos and Maestros? Now, I was in Jordan a couple of times. I went there as vacation. I wanted to see the historical sites. I wanted to see Petra. And I saw something interesting while I was driving from Jordan into Eretz Yisrael. I saw these very green fields all along the other side of the Jordan River on the Jordan side. And it was lush and it was green and it was nice and they were growing a lot of stuff there. I think that there was a diplomatic deal, in fact, between Israel and Jordan where uh, the there were farm companies from Israel that leased land over there. Anyway, that's good land. It's good growing land. You can visually see it even today. It's not like the rest of Jordan that's very dry and desiccated and desert and hard. It's it's very nice growing land, and it's lush. So that could be what's going to be coming up in the conversation today, and we're going to be trying to figure out what's going on with these lands that were also taken by Moshe Rabbeinu and the people that were in the generation of the wilderness. So the Gemara is going to continue yesterday talking about this long-standing tradition regarding cities that are in the area of Eretz Yisrael. 
And Rabbi Abahu says in this Gemara that there are Kuthian cities that people have been accustomed to treat as permitted, in other words, exempt from Trumos and Mysers, from the days of Hosea ben Nun, and they are indeed permitted. The practice is a correct one. In other words, that's what Rabbi Abahu is saying. That's a tradition that he has. Now, I want to explain that. So we know that the Kuthians are a group of non-Jews that were from Assyria, and when the Assyrians conquered uh, Sancherib went and he had a plan. This was part of the politics of the Assyrian Empire uh, as they expanded out throughout the Middle East everywhere. The policy was that they would take people from this land that they conquered and they would resettle them somewhere else. And the idea was that they wanted to undo any kind of connection to their homeland for, for any of the people. And what does that do? It strips people of these ideas of being like dukes or being like barons. It strips the upper classes of nobility. And it also strips the lower classes of saying, oh, you know, I've worked this land for five generations. I have a connection to this land. And what that does is it instills patriotism. And it was a control technique that they had as part of the state, as policy by the Assyrian Empire, to help keep down rebellion and to help assimilate the people and to help keep it an easier time to manage an empire. So what they did was there was a group of people that they had conquered. They are the Kuthians, and they transferred them over to here. And then they took people in the north, in the area of the where the ten tribes were in the northern kingdoms, and they went and settled them elsewhere in Bavel. So during the Second Temple era, uh, where the Kuthians were, um, they they were... Uh, that area is known as Samaria, and that's how they get the known the name today, where it's called uh, Samaritans. Now, this is a area that's going to be somewhere between the Judea and the Galilee, and uh, this in Bavli Hagiga 25a, this area is going to be referred to as the Strip of the Kuthians. This is where they were settled, and this strip was Teme with foreign land Tuma. That you can see in the Rashi over there. Now, the Yershami is not going to specify which villages the Kuthians settled in. Uh, but what the Yershami is going to do is it's going to just, it's just going to, it's going to list this um, area. Okay. And that's what it's doing. It's saying, Rabbi Abahu said, there are Kuthian cities that people have accustomed to treat as permitted. In other words, exempt from Trumus and Maestros and Shvius. And this is going to be from the days of Hosea ben Nun, and the, they're saying that this is a correct practice. So perhaps um, this same area that the Bobli is talking about is going to be the same villages that are going to be listed here as the Kuthian cities. So they're going to question this, and Rabbi Yosei says, this is the Amara, says, but now if you will say these Kuthian cities are considered to be outside of Eretz Yisrael, the Kohanim who live in Eretz Yisrael should not be stringent in regard to the hollow portions of those cities. In other words, they should not have to preserve them in a state of Tara. And the idea is that since hala of a foreign land is automatically teme, we do not see that the Kohanim are stringent in this case. So, by rabbinic law, we have chalots get separated out from dough, and that today, by the way, to Rabbanon, is even outside of Eretz Yisrael, but this was the law that Moshe Rabbeinu was teaching when the spies came back. This is going to be for when the Jews are going to enter the land, they're going to separate hala. So, hala in the land is going to be a deraita thing, but outside of the land is going to be a Rabbanon thing. So, you can see here that there's a lot of intricacy with the law between in the land, out of the land. Laws that are in the land, laws that are out of the land. Laws that are derived in the land, laws that are going to be derived outside of the land. Hala is one of these laws. Now, 
The Kohanim in these cities, they did not take any actions to preserve their challah in a state of Tara. And the idea is that it's clear that these Kohanim held that their cities, the Kuthian cities, and these villages are going to be within Eretz Yisrael, and they're going to say that it is going to be Tahor. So the the case in the Mishnah in Demai 4.8, that's going to be talking about two different halot, and it's going to be separated in cities that are going to be near Eretz Yisrael. So the question is going to come again, what about cities that are right on the border? What's, what's the status of that going to be for taking out Hala and Truma? So the Gemara is going to defend the tradition that Rabbi Abahu said. Rabbi Yudah ben Pazi said, the reason that those cities are exempt from Trumos and Maestros is not because of the reason that you stated. In other words, not because these areas are going to be outside of Eretz Yisrael and, and with regards to whether the, the Kohanim are you know going to be treating this um, this uh, this challah and and um, they're they're going to be treating it and they're you know that they're going to be you know preserving it in a state of tara and and uh, we see that in this area the kohenim actually are very strict about the laws of tara in this strip in other words that if you look at the behavior of the kohenim it looks like that it's within the land. And this tradition is being defended that, no, uh, it's not quite like how the, the Kohenim, you shouldn't look at the Kohenim uh, in how they're treating this uh, Chala and treating the Tara foods over there as the, as the case of whether it's going to be outside of the land or inside of the land. So Rabbi Yudah ben Pazi says the reason that these cities are exempt from Trumos and Maestros, like what Rabbi Abahu said, is not because of the reason about the Kohanim, rather it is because the non-Jewish government did not transfer those fields absolutely to the ownership of Jews. In other words, the cities there, these Kuthian cities, are certainly in Eretz Yisrael, but the fields that belong to non-Jews are, in this case, exempt from Trumos and Maestros. So the Rosh Cerilio says about this that Rabbi Yudah ben Pazi is holding that a non-Jew getting land in Eretz Yisrael is enough to exempt that land from the obligation of Trumos and Maestros. So, by the way, we were talking about this yesterday in the Shir. There's a debate between Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Shimon ben Yuhai where uh, Rabbi Meir is saying that the sanctity of this land is forever and that even the Ole Mitzrayim land has sanctity forever and never lapsed. And not only that, a non-Jew can't own land. If they're on it and they're growing on it, they're growing on it. But it's he's basically holding that the land was is uh, still belonging to someone in the in the 12 tribes. In other words, that this is still has the status of tribal land. You can't get rid of it. Somebody there who's using it is basically just a squatter, according to uh, Rabbi Meir. And basically, if this were going to be uh, like the other way, right? It'd be like with Shimon Bar Yochai. Shimon Bar Yochai holds that non-Jews can, uh, can actually own land in Eretz Yisrael. Now, in the case of Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Meir is saying that since a non-Jew never owns land in Eretz Yisrael, even if they're squatting on it, then that land will still have Kedusha and still have sanctity with regards to the produce for Trumos and Maestros and the laws of Shvias. And so if a Jew were buying from a non-Jewish market and farm and it was the, it was the seventh year, According to Rabbi Meir, that land, that produce, that crop that you're buying would still have sanctity. According to Shimon Bar Yuhai, it would not have sanctity. And so what this is saying, according to Rabbi Yudah ben Pazi, this is saying that this does not have sanctity. In other words, these farms, the reason that there's, there's no trumos and maestros over there, according to Rabbi Abahu, is not because it's outside of the land. It's trying to make a point that this is because the Kuthians are considered at this time, this is a later time, 
This is considered where they are considered now to be non-Jews. They were considered at this point now not to be real converts and that the land is owned by non-Jews. And so this is all Eretz Yisrael. And so the Kohanim who are in um, in in the uh, in the uh, in this in these cities in these cities of the Kuthians, while they're over there and they're keeping Tara, it's not because that um, that they're worried about foreign land tuma and these things. The reason that they're they're keeping all of these laws is because they're in Eretz Yisrael. They're 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 not treating it like stuff from outside of Eretz Yisrael. And the reason that they're not taking Trumos and Maestro specifically while they're in this area is not because this is outside of Eretz Yisrael. It's because this is owned by a non-Jew and they're following Shimon Bar Yuchai and they're basically saying these at this time are non-Jewish farmers and this is non-Jewish land. And so it's still within Eretz Yisrael, but it doesn't have the sanctity. The produce doesn't have the sanctity. And so that's why it's happening. Now, the Gemara wants to get into this incident regarding the status of these cities in the area of Eretz Yisrael. And Rabbi Yasser, who was a Kohen, uh, the Bavli calls him Rabbi Asi, by the way, and he's one of the most distinguished Kohenim in Eretz Yisrael in this generation. And you can see more about him in Gittin 59b. Anyway, Rabbi Yasser... The Yershavah calls him Rabbi Yasa, by the way. Uh, Bavli will be Rabbi Asi. Anyway, Rabbi Yasa, who was a Kohen, heard that his mother was traveling to Batsra. This, by the way, is going to be definitely outside of Eretz Yisrael. And Batsra is going to be outside of the Ole Babel areas. And it's going to be somewhere in Jordan. So, there. by the way, there's a city that uh, is still there and... Uh, this is an ancient Nabataean uh, city, and the Romans conquered it. And you can find, even today, uh, all sorts of Roman uh, amphitheaters and ruins in the historical Batsra city. So this is definitely outside of the Ole Babel territory. And he asks Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yasa is asking Rabbi Yochanan, and says, what is the law with regards to leaving Eretz Yisrael to come and escort my mother there, to greet my mother. And we know that the Kohanim are not allowed to leave Eretz Yisrael because they become Tameh. And a Kohen has a rule from the Torah that you're not allowed to voluntarily contaminate yourself, except with if they have to uh, have a veilis and mourning for one of their direct relatives, like a parent. So in the case of here, this area, Batsra, is definitely outside of Eretz Yisrael, but he has another mitzvah. He has to, you know, honor his mother and father. And Rabbi Yochanan now is being asked, should I go and honor my mother and escort her and greet her? Or, you know, do I have to be worried about contaminating myself and making myself teme? And so here's Rabbi Yochanan's response. He says, if it is on account of the danger of the roads, you may go and you may leave Eretz Yisrael to accompany her. But if it's on account of the mitzvah to honor your mother, you're not allowed to go. And, oh, wait, sorry. If it's, if it's on account of the mitzvah to honor your mother that you may go, I do not know whether you're allowed. He says, I, I don't know if you can go. And he's not sure because um, on one hand, you know, you're not allowed to make yourself to me. On the other hand, it's the fifth commandment. You're, you're supposed to honor your parents. And he's not sure whether anyone's allowed to leave Eretz Yisrael to fulfill a, a different mitzvah. Okay, Yes, for Poravu, you're allowed to do it to learn Torah. You're allowed to leave Eretz Yisrael as a Kohen. But what about a different mitzvah like honoring your parents? Are you allowed to do it? Rabbi Yochanan says, I'm not sure. I don't know. But if it's on Bekuach Nefesh and you're worried about her safety... And, you know, you're worried, hey, there's robbers on the road and she's vulnerable. For sure, it's Bechuach Nefesh. Go ahead. No problem. But in regards to a different mitzvah other than Poravu and getting married or learning Torah or a Parnassai issue, he's not sure. Rabbi Yasa uh, goes 
and imposes upon Rabbi Yochanan, says this Gemara, to come and give a clear answer because he's basically saying that, no, this is not because uh, this is not because of the safety of the roads. I actually just want to see her and I want to know if I can do that and be covered for doing a mitzvah. I'm going on a mitzvah mission. And he wants to know, no, you can't just say that. It's not, it's not uh, Pekuach Nefesh. And I want to know specifically, can I do it? And Rabbi Yochanan said to Rabbi Yasa, and he says, if you have already resolved uh, to leave, you may leave and come back in peace. So the idea is going to be a little bit complicated. And the way that I understand this is he's saying, he didn't actually say, go ahead. He didn't say, no, no, I changed my mind, I reconsidered, it's fine. He, he, he did something a little bit different. Okay? He says, if you've already resolved in your head, and you know, you've already made it clear, it's not for a Bakuach Nefesh issue and worry for your mother, but you've already resolved it in your head that you're going to go do it for this mitzvah mission, and you're going to go escort your mother to honor her, well... And you're you're not you're not taking my my hint or my answer that I don't know about whether that's going to work for you know just a mitzvah mission to honor your mother, and he doesn't know whether it's permissible. He didn't suddenly get you know hear a bot call to know that oh this is now permissible. He's basically just giving a response that it doesn't undermine what he had just said. He just says if you've already resolved to leave, you may come back in peace. But he didn't say go, and he didn't say you can, and he didn't say, oh, no, it's okay, or no, I've clarified this halacha, and yeah, it's fine for, you know, escorting your, your mother. He just said, if you've already resolved in your head to go, you can go, and you can come back. Now, is he going to have tuma issues? He is. Was this actually Rabbi Yochanan telling him to go? No, it really wasn't, and it was not and should not be read as a clarification of the law. And it was really just saying, like, look, if you've already resolved to go do it, you know, go do it. But, you know, he's not saying you should go do it, or this is a mitzvah, or it's worthy to do it. Because on the other hand, you know, he's also contaminating himself, and you're not supposed to do that. Uh, the other issue that comes up is when he's contaminating himself, he's doing it with foreign land tuma, which is Darabanan. So that's another thing to keep in mind. So that's what makes it so complicated because you have the law to honor your mother and father being Doraita, and then you have a thing that's set up by the rabbis of foreign land Tuma, and Kohanim are not supposed to go out of the land. This is a long-standing tradition uh, since way before the fall of the Second Temple. And so now, you know, yeah, it's fine. It's a it's a Doraita thing. I'm sorry, it's a Drabanon thing, but you know, you're not allowed to knock over fences that the rabbis put up. So Rabbi Yochanan does not give a clear response. Now, the Gemara is going to talk about the meaning of Rabbi Yochanan's response. And Rabbi Shmuel Bar Yitzhak says that the matter still needs clarification by Rabbi Yochanan. And <laughs> Basically, what this is saying is that it's it's an unclear answer whether Rabbi Yochanan uh, actually comes and endorses and says, yeah, you should go do this. You should go meet your mother outside of the land. Or if he's really just deflecting this question and basically saying, look, Rabbi Yasa, go do what you want. You've already made up your mind on it. So why are you asking me? Just go do what you want. And, you know, what it's going to count in Shemayim as, it's going to count in Shemayim. And, you know, if it were me, I wouldn't go do it because I'm not sure of the halacha. But if you've decided to go do it, you know, whatever, right? So Rabbi Lazar heard about Rabbi Yochanan's response and said, if Rabbi Yochanan blessed Rabbi Asi, there's no greater permission than this. So Rabbi Elazar, who was the student of Rabbi Yochanan, is saying that there's no doubt about the matter, and Rabbi Yochanan would not have gone so far as to issue a blessing to Rabbi Yos, uh, Yasa unless he held that, um, unless he had such a firm uh, opinion that Rabbi Yasa's dafka not allowed to go out of the land. And so we see a very similar 
uh, incident in Kiddushin 31b in the Bavli with Rabbi Asi and Rabbi Yochanan. And they're the same people. And uh, ba basically, both the Yershami and the Bavli are referring to the same incident. And uh, there's some uh, differences in the account, but it's the same incident. So the Gemara now is going to jump to this area that we were talking about in the other side of the Jordan that's going to be very, very lush. And it's going to wonder. This, this, by the way, was part of the area of the tribe of Reuben. And the Gemara is going to ask, oh, sorry, Manasseh. It's part of the tribe of Manasseh's area. It's going to be in the northern side of the Dead Sea, near where the Allenby Gate is, as you drive on the Jordan side of the river, on the Jordan-Jordan side of the river, uh, up toward uh, the the uh, Allenby Gate, which is the entrance in the north side of the Dead Sea. And this part of the area was from the tribe of uh, Manasseh. Uh, but there was also another part that was more lower, that was the tribe of Reuben, and that's lush as well. And it's still lush even to this day. And a lot of the really good produce in Jordan uh, comes from this specific area. So the Gemara is going to ask about this section. And Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish asks Rabbi Hanina, one who acquires a field in the lands of Ammon or Moab, what is the law regarding Shvius there? The Shvius going to be observed now. This is trying to figure out what, you know, what's going to be with this status that was conquered by, in a way, Moshe Rabbeinu and not Joshua. And it definitely was not uh, part of the land from the Ole, uh, Ole Bavel. But nonetheless, there were, there, was a, there were tribes that were there. So what's going to be the status? And what is the law on Shvius? And so... He answers him, Rabbi Hanina answers him, and he says, I did not hear from Rabbi Hia the Great whether Shvius applies there. However, from the crossroads of Ashkelon and outwards is considered outside of the land and therefore is exempt from the observance of Shvius. So Rabbi Hanina's response seems to be uh, a little bit different than you'd expect. He doesn't talk about the land over here in Moab and Anan and 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 Amman, he's talking about all the way over there on the other side of the country, all the way to the west, back to Ashkelon again. And so we're talking about all the way to the east. He's talking about all the way to the west. So that's a that's a hard answer to understand. It's a big deflection. And the Gemara says this is difficult to understand because Rish Lakish is asking him regarding Amman and Moab. This is on the other side. It's in the east. And Rabbi Hanina is asking him and on, on Ashkelon and outwards, that's going to be in the southwest. In other words, he's not answering the question. And they want to push this. They want to know more. And the Gemara is going to answer. Rather, the explanation is this. Since Rabbi Hanina never in his lifetime stated any ruling that he heard that he had not heard expressly from his teacher. He did not respond directly to Rish Lakish's inquiry. So the idea here, says Rabbi Kanievsky, is that Rabbi Hanina had not uh, heard anything from his teacher regarding the status of this particular land in Amman and Moab. And so his conduct was that Rabbi Hanina would follow the example of the Tana, Rabbi Ele, uh, Eliezer, who in turn followed the example from his teacher, Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai. And basically, he was only just talking about from his teacher what he heard. That's really amazing. In other words, he was not doing any innovation at all, which is admirable, admirable by the way. He was just saying, this is the tradition that I got, and this is what I heard. And his answer is basically saying, I never heard anything from my teacher over there. And I'm not going to give you any kind of opinions that I have. I'm only going to relay what I heard from my teacher. That is amazing. That's amazing, Derek Eretz. So the idea here uh, continues. And the Gemara says, Since Rabbi Hanina did not want to send Rish Lakish away empty-handed without answering him at all, for that reason, he asked him one thing and he answered him another. So... 
The reason that he gave him an answer altogether rather than say, I don't know, or I didn't hear it, is he wanted to give him something that he heard from his teacher. That is amazing, Derek Eretz. So now there's a story that continues, and people you know, want to know, what about the status of this land just over the Jordan River? It's nice. It's lush. What, what do we do with it? And what happens if there's Jews there that are farming? Do you keep Shvius there or not? And again, there was a uh, Jewish corporation that was farming there uh, even up to a year or two ago. Do they separate Shvius out of that? Well, this Gemara is going to be getting into that. So Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish traveled to Batsra, and the townspeople came uh, to him and they said, show us a person who was an orator, a, a judge, a scribe, a sexton. This is a person who is a... Uh, a caretaker of a synagogue, and they, and they, the Gemara continues and says, and who will perform all of our needs. So basically, uh, it sounds like they're looking for a rabbi, and they're asking, you know, one of the greats for help. So Rish Lakish spotted a certain Babylonian who had all of these qualifications, because they were looking for a leader of a community. And the Gemara says, and he told them, I have spotted a good rabbinical position for you in Batsra, where you will be able to support yourself. And the Babylonian came to Rabbi Yochanan to ask if he's allowed to leave uh, Babel to go to Batsra. Uh, so the Gemara is going to continue. And Rabbi Yochanan told him, that is like traveling from Babylonia to Babylonia. In other words, you have no problem there. You know, there's no reason... Uh, you know, you're already in Chutz Aretz, so what are you worried about going to a different city in Chutz Aretz? That's basically the idea of what Rabbi Yochanan is telling him. So this is a way to understand, you know, if you were even a Kohen and you're already living in, in Chutz Aretz, you know, do you need to be worried about going to a different city in Chutz Aretz? No. We're only concerned about things within Eretz Yisrael and out of Eretz Yisrael for the time being in this conversation. So the Gemara is going to continue. And Rabbi Yaakov Bar Abba says, from what Rabbi Yochanan said, that traveling from Babel to Batsra is like traveling from Babylonia to Babylonia, this tells us that one who acquires a field there in Batsra is not obligating the laws of Shvius. So the idea here is that, says the Pnei Moshe, since Batsra is definitely outside of the land of Israel, there's no obligation to observe agricultural laws with land that is, you know, outside of Eretz Yisrael. And so, just like you're not observing over there in Eretz Yisrael, or in Bavel, for agricultural laws, so too in Batsra you don't need to as well. Well, that is going to be interesting, and that has a lot of caveats. That's a, a monumental ruling because what's going to be coming up is to say, well, wait a second. Wasn't that area all taken by the, the people in the wilderness? Wasn't that all taken by Moshe Rabbeinu? How can you say it doesn't have any sanctity? It must have something, right? And so we have these different statuses of land. What is going to be the status of land just before the Jews entered into Eretz Yisrael? But nonetheless, Moshe Rabbeinu is leading the people there. Is that not like a conquering army? In fact, there was even some wars over there. So the Gemara is going to challenge this and it's going to say, but is it not forbidden for Kohenim to travel to Tyre? That's going to be in the north in Lebanon along the coast because of foreign land Tuma. And it is, you know, Tyre is basically going to be deemed to be outside of Eretz Yisrael. And the Gemara says that, yet, is it not true that one who acquires a field there is obligated to tie the produce? So the question that the Kohen was asking, Rabbi Yasa was asking to Rabbi Yochanan, is actually going to be more deep when we get into this Gemara. Really, Rabbi Yasa's question is saying, look, my mom is traveling on a road in Batsra. And Batsra was conquered, Was it was in the area that Moshe Rabbeinu was in. So are you going to count that like foreign land Tuma at all? And so that could be a question of, hey, 
Maybe that's why Rabbi Yochanan did not give a clear answer. So that that's a deeper idea. Rabbi Yochanan might not be sure that this rabbinic or uh, this rabbinic, rabbinic ruling on foreign lands Tuma would should that apply to land that was also going to be from Moshe Rabbeinu? That could be why he's not sure. So this Gemara here has this similar idea. It says, look, a Cohen is not allowed to go to Tyre because of foreign lands Tuma, and it continues yet and says, yet is it not true that one who acquires a field there is obligated to tithe produce? And so the idea here is that um, if you're getting a field entire, you still have to do tithes. So what's what what's going on? And then the Gemara is basically hinting and asking over here, according to the uh, commentary by uh, the the Ziv Hayam Safe Twenty Nine and saying that there's a fundamental dispute between the Roshonim whether a rabbinical obligation to tithe was going to be placed on all places close to Eretz Yisrael or only four specific countries, Amman, Moab, Egypt, and Shinar, that's Bavel. So the, the question gets deeper. It says that, and the idea here is that, you know, if you have to do tithing on produce and tire, then what about trumos and maestros? And, you know, shouldn't it be where this obligation would also go on to Batra because it's going to be close to Eretz Yisrael like Tyre? And in fact, it's not just close to Eretz Yisrael, but in fact, the, the Jewish people wandered by there. So the Gemara is going to talk about a brisa regarding the status of Amman and Moab, and Rabbi Yaakov Bar Abba found a brisa that taught as follows. And it says a mnemonic uh, to remember the status of Ammon, Moab, and the land of Egypt in regards to the law of Shvias. And it says that there are two areas. This is, by the way, opposed to our Mishnah that says that there are three areas. And the three areas uh, here in the Mishnah are going to be there. And the two areas that are going to be here in this are going to be Chutzal Arts and the Ole Mitzrayim territory. So it says in this uh, Barisa, it says there are two areas. The produce of one area, Egypt, may be eaten after the Bure deadline has passed and the land itself may be worked. In other words, that's going to be treated like Chutzal Arts for sure. You know, there's no Shvius over there and it's going to be like the Chutzal Arts that's going to be described in this Mishnah here in chapter 6, Halacha 1. And the second part of this, Baraisa says, uh, and and the produce of the other area, Amman and Moab, may be eaten even after the Bure deadline, but the land itself may not be worked. So this is saying, wait a second, you have some Shvias restrictions here, and this is going to be similar to the Ole Mitzrayim territory in this, Mish in this Mishnah. And so they're saying, hey, wait a second, um, you know, why shouldn't Basra's land uh, be in, you know, not be worked during Shvius? And why should it be that the produce may be eaten after the Bure deadline? And so, you know, normally, you know, one may not work the land during Shvius, but with regards to parts of Amman and Moab, they were never captured uh, by uh, Sichon. Uh, the, there's, this is talking about parts of Amman, Moab that were originally conquered by Sichon and then conquered by Moses. And Moses conquered all of Sichon's uh, area. And the idea here is that um, Sichon actually did a lot of the work and actually got rid of a lot of the, you know, sort of cleaned up the area, got rid of a lot of people. And then Moses just got rid of Sichon. So they're saying like, look, you know, this is, this was, this was taken by, this was, you know, taken by Moses. So what do we do with this land? And the Gemara is going to talk about another discussion between Rish Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan regarding Batsra and this land. So the Gemara says that Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish thought to say that Batsra in Moab is identical with Beitzer in the wilderness 
and that's going to be named in the tor in the Torah as the territory of Reuven. And uh, Bezer was part of the area of the Transjordan that's first conquered by Sihon, and then it gets conquered by Moses, and then given to the tribe of Reuben as part of this territory. And again, all along the uh, the the uh, the Jordan River there, including all the way up to the the areas that's going to be part of the tribe of Manasseh, up by that uh, gate where they have a crossing between Jordan and Israel today, and then the lower parts that are going to be in the tribe of Reuben. Um, these are these are lush, nice areas, and you know what do you do with it? So. Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish is basically saying, well, Bezer isn't Bezer just Batsra. And it's just, you know, it was, you know, it was already given. And it was already given to uh, the tribe of Reuben. Now, if the city uh, here is going to be the same biblical city as a Bezer, then it should be that this city would be part of Eretz Yisrael and it would be obligated as Maestros. And in the Bavli of Odazara 58b, it's saying that Rish Lakish visited Batsra and he thought it was Eretz Yisrael and he would not allow residents over there to eat the produce before they tithed it. So again, you have some question as to whether this is going to have sanctity or not. And, you know, part of the idea here is that in Egypt and Amman, it's really going to be like Hutzal Aretz and it's going to be treated. Um, more strictly with regards to, you know, separating out uh, trumos and maestros. Basically, you can't, right? And basically, don't worry about working the land there. And basically, you know, it's really going to be treated as definite hutzla arts for, you know, uh, you know, land tuma and everything else. But the area that Moshe Rabbeinu comes and conquers in Amman and Moab that's a question whether it should be more holy and more sanctified and if it should be treated more stringently than other areas that were never actually conquered by Moses, Joshua, or Ezra. What this is doing is this is bringing into the conversation the land that Moses took over but not the conquering tribes of Joshua and not the Ole Babel. What do you do with this land? And that's why... Botsra keeps coming up. And so they're saying, isn't it going to be where this is going to be Bezer in the wilderness and this was handed over, it's in the Torah itself. Uh, and you can find that in Devarim 4.43. And since you know Moses conquered uh, Sihon's area, this should be uh, really more, more like the rest of the land that's, that's conquered actually by uh, Moshe Rabbeinu student, Joshua, right? So that's kind of what's being asked. And so he asked Rabbi Yochanan if he agreed that Batsra is Bezer in the Torah. And Rabbi Yochanan told him that Bezer is not Batsra. And he says that Batsra is outside of Eretz Yisrael. So basically, they're trying to, to draw a line of where this is. Now, keep in mind, Rish Lakish went into Batsra and said, you can't you you know you can't eat shvias produce on shvias here. This has kedusha, and Rabbi Yochanan is saying no, it doesn't. It's not it's not Bezer from the Torah, and it should be noted that Bezer is one of these three cities of refuge that gets designated by Moses uh, just on the other side of the Jordan. By the way, so the question is going to be that uh, you know should should this have sanctity because this is also going to be uh, one of the one of the um, uh, one of the uh, the cities of refuge and you know perhaps this is just being confused though so Gamara is going to repeat the question of Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish and he's going to comment on it and Rabbi Yitzhak bar Nachman repeated it to the students of the academy, and he asks the following question. He says, Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish asked Rabbi Hanina, one who acquires a parcel of land from the territories of Amman and Moab, what is the law? In other words, 
What about Shvias and Maestros in this strip of land that's on the other side of the Jordan that's lush and good for farming even to this day? And Rabbi Yitzhak Bar Nachman said, I question this inquiry to Shimon ben Lakish in the presence of Rabbi Yasa. Were the territories of Ammon and Moab not the conquest of Moshe? In other words, since Moshe Rabbeinu conquered this strip of land just on the other side of the border, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't this be part of Eretz Yisrael? And shouldn't this be subject to the laws of Shvias and Maestros? So how could anybody have any doubt about it? So again, one of the questions is going to be, what happens when Moshe Rabbeinu takes land? And then, you know, we're talking about this land that was not part of the conquering armies. It was part of the Jews, you know, just coming into it uh, and taking it in the war with Sichon. Is that going to count? And the Gemara now is going to move on to a different comment with a different Amara on this. And Rabbi Mana said, I too questioned this question of Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish, but in the presence of Rabbi Haggai, and said, were not these parts of Ammon and Moab the conquest of Moshe Rabbeinu? And basically, they are. They are the conquest of of Moshe Rabbeinu. And, you know, if we're talking about unconquered areas of Oman and Moab, then basically, says this Gemara, are not these parts of Oman and Moab discussed by Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah in the Mishnah and Yedayim? In other words, those parts that are certainly outside of Hutza Aretz, that are definitely unconquered by this um, war with Sichon, by Moshe Rabbeinu, these other more eastern parts of Oman and Moab, well, Rabbi Lazar ben Azaria talks about that in the Mishnah and Yedayim, and those areas over there are exempt. But what about what about these specific areas along this lush green strip right along the Jordan River? What about that? And the question is, what what's going to be the law of Shvias with regards to you know this land? Is this going to be part of uh, the land or not? Does this take possession of the land or not? And uh, the Gemara is going to answer. Rabbi Yosei, the son of Rabbi Bun, says, It is written, for Heshbon, it was the city of Sichon, king of the Amorite, and he had warred against the first king of Moab and took all of his land uh, from his control until Arnon. This, by the way, is in Numbers 21-26. And the Gemara says, It was necessary for Shimon ben Lakish, Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish, to clarify the following point, regarding this verse. In other words, that the Torah is forbidding the Jewish people to conquer the lands of Ammon and Moab. But we know that Sichon had conquered parts of Ammon and Moab for himself. And this is before the Jewish people conquered him. So look, there was a deal where you can't take over Ammon and Moab. But somebody else came and took over these parts of Ammon and Moab. And he made, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu made war against Sichon. And thereby took it, because Moshe Rabbeinu didn't make war on Ammon and Moab. Ammon and Moab, these areas here, they already lost and left. This was already done. And so that waiver lapsed. That's basically the idea. So, you know, Moshe was allowed and even commanded to engage Sichon in battle and take possession of the land. This, by the way, you can see where Hashem is saying to Moses, See, I have begun to deliver before you Sihon and his land and begin to drive him out to possess his land. This is in Devarim 2.31. And so the question is, says this Gemara, did the land, this combined part of Ammon and Moab, become purified of any association with Ammon and Moab at the hand of Sihon? Or did it not become purified at this association? So, this is a deeper question as to what do we do with this land? Because you have a requirement not to make war, harass, or take land from Ammon and Moab. And the question is, now that Sichon took these areas, is it going to be a case where, look, when Hashem said, don't take these areas, that even though Sichon came and took it from the, the kings of Ammon and Moab, 
and now kick them out and you're just taking uh, Sikhon's land, does that obligation still apply? And this is part of the question about what do we do with this land? Because it could be that maybe Moshe Rabbeinu didn't even take it. In other words, yes, he took it. But because you had a previous restriction on it from Hashem, maybe it still does not have any sanctity. It doesn't count as your land. Maybe this uh, was not cleansed of an obligation from an earlier time. In other words, maybe this uh, this requirement, even though Sichon took it and took possession of it, maybe this has not become purified with this association of Amman and Moab. And so that's going to be the question. That's that's why we wonder what's going to be with Shvius and Maestros over there. So the Gemara says, if you say it became purified, then once Moses conquered it, it becomes subject to the laws of Shvius and Maestros. And if you say that it does not become purified, then it is exempt from the restrictions of Shvius and Maestros. In other words, even though Moshe Rabbeinu and the Jewish people conquer it, it's not going to be considered as part of Eretz Yisrael since it does not lie within the borders that's going to be defined within the Parshas of Massey, and it's going to be exempt by land-dependent mitzvahs. So, in other words, the question is, was this going to be cleansed or not? And, you know, the, the Jewish people, the Torah is forbidding the Jewish people to conquer the lands of Oman and Moab. You're not allowed to do it. And so the question is, when Moshe Rabbeinu conquers Sihon, who takes part of this land, does this earlier obligation still apply? And if it does, then this land does not have sanctity for Trumos and Maeseros, and the only land that does will be what is talked about in the Parsha in, in uh, Masay. So the Gemara is going to resolve this, and... And then we're going to leave another questionable territory for tomorrow, but we're going to finish this up now. So Rabbi Tanhuma says that Scripture states in Devarim 2.31, says, See, I have begun to deliver before you Sichon in this land, and begin, Chechel, uh, to drive him out to take possession of his land. And the word Chechel uh, can be understood or considered as a cognate of Hulin, which is ordinary and unrestricted. And this verse can be interpreted to mean, according to Rabbi Tanhuma, I have rendered Sichon's land unrestricted before you. In other words, it is free of any association from Amman and Moab, and there is no longer any restriction for you to take it. In other words, once Sichon took the land and drove out Amman and Moab from it, it's now going to be conquered by Moshe Rabbeinu. And because it's conquered by Moshe Rabbeinu, the King Sihon effectively cleansed this land of the obligation that existed earlier not to conquer land for the Jews, not to conquer this land from Amman and Moab. And so once it's taken, now it's going to be considered fully Eretz Yisrael, and it's going to be dependent on uh, mitzvahs regarding the land. In other words, what this is saying is that this land, this strip of land that's lush, that's even there today, that's that's arable and nice, this area of the Transjordan over there is going to be fully regarded as Eretz Yisrael, regarding other matters as well, not only land Tuma, but also going to be for uh, the laws of Shvius and Trumos and Maestros. So I want to point out that this Yershami's conclusion is in conflict with the Bavli and Hulin 60b that Amman and Moab were purified by Sihon without question. And Rish Lakish holds that view there that it is uh, cleansed. That's why he went to Batsra and was saying, no, 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 don't eat the Shvi'as produce. You can't do that. That's consistent. But um, the Vilna Gon is going to explain Rabbi Tankulma's statement and the Gemara's conclusion in the opposite way. And he's basically, uh, you know, going to be uh, following uh, the, I mean, the the explanation here by Rabbi Tankuma, by the way, follows the Ramban and and basically is holding that, um, that it was cleansed, but um, 
there, there is a different approach, and the question is still going to remain whether this part of this land, even today, is going to uh, have sanctity or not. And it's not universal that um, that Moab and and uh, Amman were purified. And um, you know, Rish Lakish holds that it was, and and certainly Rabbi Tanhuma holds that it was. But um, you know, there are there are you know, Vilna Gon is going to read this in an opposite way, and basically hold that uh, this was not. Uh, this was not cleansed, and that's going to make it um, uh, a different reading that's going to make it more in line with the Bavli and Hulin 60b. Anyway, this is really important stuff to think about, and uh, covering the more difficult and knotty parts of uh, the Gemara is, according to the Chazanish's book on uh, Amuna and Bitechon, really the highest form of worship that we can do, and it helps to deepen our understanding of the ways of Hashem, and it helps us to understand the Mikra better, and every time that we can get into these very difficult sugyas and hard to understand and to pick apart, the better we are as people. Have a great day.